Popcorn Forum, I think you're in for an exciting evening. As you can see, we have six extraordinary historical characters who are here to first present briefly their biographic information to you and then to take questions on any subject from you. Let me start by introducing myself. My name is Clay Jenkinson. I'm happy to be here for my fourth year, thanks to North Idaho College and, and Tony Stewart. I want to thank all of you for coming out on a Friday night and a gorgeous one at that. Uh, to be part of this. Um, we hope you will be planning the questions you intend to ask of any or all of these historical characters. I don't suppose you've had a chance to meet all of them in the course of the week, although they all have had a chance to speak in one way or another. But let's start by some review. The theme of this Popcorn Forum is the millennium, what happened in the millennium. A retrospective on the last thousand years. We don't quite cover all of it. We begin with Queen Elizabeth, who was born in 1534, that is in the 16th century, so halfway through, and then we make our way all the way up to 1940, 1969, so almost contemporary. So let's begin. I'm going to ask each one of you to say a few words about your contribution to the millennium. Let's begin with Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth I. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Uh, as you know, I was probably the most powerful woman in Europe for over 500 years, and still perhaps one of the most powerful matriarchs that ever uh, sat in the seat in England. Um, I certainly covered a time when things were most difficult in England, and, and the world was a very different, much cooler kind of world uh, than it certainly is today. Uh, my contribution that I consider to be the greatest is probably one that uh, you'd have to know me very well to perhaps understand uh, the Virgin Queen, the the woman, the single woman, um, un, unrelated to other, not married, uh, who goes about having a full life, who sees herself full without being married, and who manages to dangle uh, her marriage possibilities around Europe sufficiently enough to manipulate a number of different empires to the success of maintaining England's strength. And uh, she came to power when England was not strong. And when she died, England was in the lead position throughout Europe. So in recapping, I'd say that her ability to be a strong woman, to be a single woman, I think, and to show that that's possible, might have been one of her greatest contributions. Of course, one of your greatest contributions. Let me ask you this. Uh, isn't it true, uh, Your Majesty, that you survived a number of Absolutely. Death threats uh, from your earliest childhood to almost the time of your death. Absolutely. At, at 17, I was in the Tower of London, uh, where uh, I managed to uh, get out of, but that was a close call. And from there, uh, as I can remember, at least I had five assassinations attempts on my life throughout uh, the period that I was queen, um, including the last one, which was uh, very, very close. And if you had not been a pivotal figure, if you had not been the monarch of Britain, do you think you would have married? Uh, that's, a, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I'm not sure I can answer that. You weren't disposed. I mean, you weren't tempted by some of these dashing young men, some of them less than half your age, who courted you all of your life. I think I got what I wanted from them without marriage. <laughs> <coughs> I withdraw the question. <laughs> Very well, then. We'll come back to you. I'm sure the audience will have many questions for you, but let's wait until we've had a chance to meet everyone now. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, if you've ever heard him at the Popcorn Forums, has said without ambiguity that the greatest man who ever lived with the possible exception of Jesus was Sir Isaac Newton. Hello. Good evening. I would thank Thomas, and I would agree with him. Um, I think it could uh, easily be said that my greatest contribution um, to the world in this millennium was the creation of the modern scientific method. A number of my detractors um, that I, I guess, could say I despise because of their callousness in, in their personal attacks on what I did with physics, the creation of the fluxions, calculus, to be able to um, demonstrate some of the um, laws of, of, the, uh, of the world that I expounded on, um, all they could do was say that it simply did not agree with their own personal beliefs, but they had uh, little, usually no, experimentation that would back up their observations or their theories. And I, I found that reprehensible. Um, 
I believe that modern science, any science, needs to be able to not only hypothesize, but be able to predict, to be able to say this would be the results, and then go look for them, go experiment. Now, most people, when they think of scientists, think of secularists, even atheists, certainly people who are hyper-rational, and yet I believe you believe that the foundation of most of your mature work was Christian in its base. Is that not so? That's quite correct. I was a very firm believer. Uh, my beliefs differed from the Orthodox churches at the time, and I had to be careful about that. But very definitely, my work was um, predicated on being able to discover the workings uh, of the world, that as God created this world, I really wanted to understand uh, how we did it, how this world works. I'm going to ask a question that I've wanted to ask for all of my life. I believe almost everyone in the audience will share this uh, curiosity with me. Can you explain in terms that we might understand what calculus is? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I, would, I would ask first, before you really try to understand what calculus is about, that you, uh, out of necessity, must do the background reading. And for me, that would be um, certainly the works of Euclid and the work of uh, my predecessor, René Descartes, uh, his geometry book. And then I think you might have a chance uh, to understand some of the material that I worked. Uh, in a few words, I would say calculus is really the mathematics of change, how things change. We'll leave it at that, not knowing how to ask a follow-up question. Uh, <laughs> we'll move on for the moment, but thank you. Now to another one of, of Thomas Jefferson's heroes. Um, in some regards, um, the applier of uh, modern mathematics to physical forces, uh, James Watt. Good evening. Um, my greatest invention, I was an inventor, and I imagine my greatest invention, my greatest contribution to the millennium would be the modifications that I applied to the steam engine to allow the harnessing of the power of fire so that it could be applied to human benefit. Uh, humans were trapped by low power supplies uh, as an agricultural society with only human power or domesticated animals for power, wind power or water power. And there are such shortcomings to all those sources of energy that I think my modifications to the steam engine enlarged the scope of human existence because of a, a brand new energy supply. You're not claiming to have invented the steam engine. Who did that? Um, well, there were several people. The first functioning steam engine was, was uh, set up by Thomas Newcomen. Um, there were people before him, a man named Savory that had a functioning engine. But probably Newcomen should get the credit for the first working steam engine. And what sorts of applications did you envision for this great tool? Well, as long as there had been the removal of minerals from the earth, whether it be fossil fuel like coal, or if it were minerals for iron or tin, uh, the miner would encounter water and the deeper you, you made a hole in the earth, the more it filled up with water. So there needed to be an efficient uh, method of pumping water. But because of my efficient engine, it could move from the world of a pumping engine to the world of an engine that drove machines. So the, the cotton mills or the woolen mills or the foundries could have another power supply. When we think of steam, we think of locomotion. Did you envision locomotion? Um, I certainly hoped there was a better way to get around on the surface of the earth other than riding behind a horse in a carriage. But I saw the limitations. I understood the mathematics, the efficiency of my engine, and I didn't see how it was possible to build a steam carriage even though one of the engineers I worked with for many years was obsessed with them, I reluctantly turned my talents to them 
uh, to the development of a steam carriage, but uh, with my steam engine design, it was not possible. Because it was not portable? Because the condenser was carried with us at all times and it also needed a, a continual re refreshment of water. And so the limitations of large mass, the separate condenser, and the refilling of water made the probability of a, a steam engine very unlikely. I'm happy to tell you that we overcame some of those obstacles uh, shortly after your time. Let's move on to maybe the first serious feminist writer in the history of Western civilization, certainly the fieriest of the 18th century, uh, not read by Thomas Jefferson, not read by Abigail Adams, but interestingly read by Aaron Burr. I'd like you now to meet Mary Wollstonecraft. Thank you. Uh, a fiery writer, perhaps. I believe that gave me the reputation of a hyena in petticoats, as a matter of fact, and a serpentine philosopher. I've been called a woman ahead of my time, and perhaps you'll see why through my contributions. My goal in life was to educate myself. I believed in education for all people, women included, and for the betterment of the world. While I was interested in education, I was not the only person interested in education. Other people, women included, had written about it. But I came along at just the right time to link the issue of education into another cause of mine, which was human rights. And certainly during the French Revolution, which I observed close and first of ha at hand, I actually was in France during the Revolution. Uh, in fact, I saw Louis carted through the dark streets and it, it touched me so greatly that I could not put my candle out that night. It, I, I feared so much for what was going on. But I did concern myself with the role of women during this time when civil rights were so much in question. Two of my greatest contributions were two books that I wrote. Um, probably not my greatest book uh, before these two was a book on education of young girls. But I wrote a, a book in response to that insufferable egotist uh, Edmund Burke uh, regarding the French Revolution in which I took him to task for his uh, unbelievably repressive ideas. That was the vindication of men in 1790. I followed that in 1792 with probably my most famous book which is The Vindication of the Rights of Woman. And in that book I laid forth my ideas specifically about the need for education for women and actually for a change in their manners for without women reforming themselves there is no way to reform the world. Um, I also began a book on the history of, of the French Revolution, which I had to abandon for other interests. But I did manage, I, I believe, to discover for myself the value of education and an adventure. I believe that independence would be mine even if I had to live in a barren field, I would have independence. And though I did have uh, a liaison with a, a gentleman who departed from me for another woman, and in the end I married William Godwin. Um, I maintained my, actually, my independence with William Godwin. We kept separate quarters and worked separately. So we tried very hard to keep the marriage of true minds, as Shakespeare would say, that we felt was important in maintaining our independence. And I believe that one of my other enemies, actually in some thoughts, not in all, uh, Rousseau, was one who said that the world was better as it was. I lived with a group of writers, my contemporaries, who believed the world was just fine the way it was, and I believe that the world will be better in the future. And I'm excited to see how the future has brought about many of the things that I wished would occur. I see you have a, a copy of Rousseau's famous educational tract, The Emil. What, what uh, is your critique of Rousseau? Well, I actually agree a great deal with Rousseau until we get to the chapter, uh, book five, which is why I brought this volume, where he discusses the education of Sophie. Out of all the entire book, you can see how huge the book is, he dedicates uh, a small portion here to the education of women. And if you, might, will you indulge me while I just read a passage or two here? Certainly. <clears throat> Only uh, this principle is established, having established a principle about the fact that one in a relationship of two sexes should be active and strong and the other passive and weak. Once this principle is established, it follows that woman is made especially to please man. If man ought to please her in turn, it is due to a less direct necessity. If woman is made to please and be subjugated, she ought to make herself agreeable to man instead of arousing him. 
Her own violence is in her charms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I take it you, you honor Rousseau for his general philosophy of liberation, but not for his treatment of women. Correct. Thank you. We will move on. There's unfortunately no 19th century representative here. We have the 16th century, the 17th century, the 18th century, but no 19th century. But let's move on to the late 19th and early 20th centuries for our last two panelists. Uh, first, the man who has been called the greatest economist of all time, John Maynard Keynes. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> my, my world did start in the 19th century. I was born in 1883. I was very fortunate to have had as parents uh, very enlightened people, including a mother who was uh, followed in the work of Mary Wollstonecraft and was a strong advocate of education for women. I absorbed those ideas as well as the economic ideas of my father, John Keynes, who was also an economist at Cambridge. But I was very fortunate in that in the uh, years uh, uh, of the first part of the 20th century, I became part of a group well known in Great Britain called the Bloomsbury Group. We had as our guiding principles a love, a true love of aesthetics, of hard work, and of love. And we broke free from many of the conventions of uh, our 19th century forebears. We uh, uh, realized that uh, the hocus pocus of Christianity, for example, was not really necessary, although in later years I came to recognize that the stability of the society, the st stability of our culture was due in part, uh, in large part, to the traditions of Christianity, but uh, we did realize that there were, there were, as we like to say, uh, hocus pocus elements about it that we need not adhere to. In many ways, I was very uh, unfortunate to have lived through both the First World War and the Second World War. On the other hand, those two great events of the 20th century gave me the opportunity to see at first hand how necessary it was for us as scholars, for us as intellectuals, to change to understand, in order to understand the uh, changing conditions of our world. The problem, as I said in one address, was not so much the difficulty of new ideas as the difficulty of getting rid of old ideas. And I continued with that pillar that, that, that idea throughout my intellectual life. I um, was part of the government of Great Britain during the First World War, and yet I opposed the First World War. I was not a pacifist, although I claimed to be one at the time, but what I really was was opposed to our participation, Great Britain's participation, in the First World War. Even more important, uh, was my uh, uh, very strong disagreement with the policies of the, of the uh, Allies following the First World War and the reparations that we exacted from Germany. Germany, after all, as anybody uh, at the time would have had to agree, and I think this was uh, really part of the problem, was the powerhouse, the economic powerhouse of Europe. And we were determined to undo it simply because they had lost a war, a war that uh, really did not uh, stand for principle as much as territorial uh, uh, movement. And so I opposed in my first well-known piece the economic consequences of the peace, the reparations, and I predicted at that time that if we were to continue if we were to refuse to come to terms with Germany uh, and, and do away with the reparations, if we were to fail to recognize that Germany was a powerful nation, intrinsically a powerful nation, and try to exact our vengeance, that we would pay the price. And I unfortunately was right, because I think that uh, 
uh, a large part of the reason for the coming to power of Adolf Hitler and therefore the Second World War were these ill-founded policies of ours between the wars. Time went on and I realized that my, my fellow economists were, uh, were simply holding on to some ideas that were not true. I don't want to uh, get into, into the detail of, the, of these things, but what they were saying was that there was a natural equilibrium uh, at a, uh, uh, the supply created its own demand. And as they say, uh, we don't have the time, and this is not the place to get into the details of that, uh, but supply created its own demand. Therefore, over the long run, we would have full employment and supply and demand would be in, in uh, consonance. The, these were ideas that went back through Ricardo to Malthus to Adam Smith. But the fact of the matter is, as I pointed out at the time, in the long run, we're all dead. It makes much more sense to deal with the short run and try to fix what we can of the economy and the society as we find it for the betterment of all uh, of all of us. And so I, I fairly late, eschewed the, the ideas that have since come to be known as monetarist ideas in economics and, and determined that, in fact, the policies that were already being begun in Sweden, to some extent in Great Britain and to some extent in the United States with what you called the New Deal, were in fact intellectually correct. This was one of my major contributions. Not that I, that I came up with the ideas that led to the New Deal, but I lent intellectual respectability to the New Deal. And you were right. You have every reason to be proud of what you did under your president, President Roosevelt, in the 1930s to get your nation and thus the rest of the world out of the quagmire of the Great Depression. Um, I then was involved in the uh, uh, years immediately after, or the year immediately after the uh, end of the Second World War and was largely responsible for the creation of the Bretton Woods Conference that led to the international economic understanding that governs the Western world today. Um, and uh, I think that's probably enough. Let me just ask one brief follow-up question. When we hear the word Keynesian all the time. Most people have no idea. I admit I don't really know what that means. Can you give us a brief definition of Keynesian? Yes. Uh, there, <laughs> there was my, my economics, the economics of John Maynard Keynes, and then there was Keynesian economics, which grew out of my ideas following my death. And what you hear now, I presume, is all about Keynesian economics, which is the elaboration of my ideas. And that's fine. I am a great advocate, I was a great advocate, of change in response to reality. Keynesian economics is the economics of fiscal involvement of governments in the economy. What that means is, in times of depression, for example, it is necessary for a government to weigh in to uh, make investment in the economy since there is not an equilibrium between supply and demand. There was, in, the 19, in 1929 to 32, much more supply than there was demand. Remember, your depression was not a depression of scarcity. It was, a scare, it was a depression due to a great abundance. There was an abundance of labor, abundance of skilled labor, abundance of raw materials, and an abundance of, uh, of uh, in an industrial nation that was able to produce more than was being bought. What was necessary, therefore, was for government to weigh in and start hiring people, buying things, become a consumer, to refire the economy so it could once again reach its own equilibrium. That, in a nutshell, is okay. Keynesian economics. Thank you. We have some follow-up questions we'll come back to. 
if you could just pass the mic and let me warn each of you, um, I've been advised by our technical crew not to speak into the mic, uh, but just to leave it out there and they will take care of the amplification. I know you're all dead and you don't quite understand this, but, uh, but I promise you that it's technically sound. All right. Now, I think you all probably knew in some sense or other each of the characters you've met so far. I would dare say that you don't know the one that you are about to meet. I would like now to introduce Charlotta Spears Bass. Thank you. Um, as he said, I am Charlotta Spears Bass. Most of you have never heard of me because historians and political scientists decided that my campaign was of no importance. I was the first woman and the first person of color to run for Vice President of the United States back in 1952 with Vincent Halliman. I had the distinct <clears throat> honor of running against Richard Nixon when he first ran for Vice President. And may I say once again, that man is corrupt. I knew him since he was a boy and I had never heard anything good about him. Now, my influence on this millennium, this century, our motto was always win or lose, we win by raising the issues. The issues that I raised were the inequalities towards minorities and towards women. I went to the halls of Congress and said, you do not have enough women congressmen, you do not have enough minority congressmen, we need equal representation. In Los Angeles, I formed the Home Protective Asso eh, pardon, Association, which was formed to put down the restrictive covenants that were being formed to prevent blacks from moving into all white neighborhoods. When I found out that there was not one, but two Republican parties, one for whites and one for blacks, I went and became one of the founders of the Progressive Party, which I felt was the only one that truly supported civil rights. Later on, after running for vice president, after founding several organizations serving as the national chairperson for the Sojourners for Truth and Justice, running for the LA City Council, becoming the first black to serve on a grand jury in Los Angeles County, I wrote my only book, 40 Years, Memoirs of a Newspaper. And in that book, I brought out all of the good things that black Americans have done for America. Many people do not realize that of the 44 individuals that initially founded Los Angeles, 26 of them were black. Only two were Caucasian. The rest were Indian and Mexican. And yet you will find that so deeply buried in the annals of history that no one even thinks about it. And there are many contributions that blacks have made over the years that have never been written about because of the way historians consider what is or is not important. So again, win or lose, we win by raising the issues. Um, let me ask you a question about your attitudes toward and your work uh, with respect to war. Ah, war. My motto on that was guns or butter. How dare you go over and rebuild a decadent Europe when the blacks of Harlem are starving? How dare you not help your own people first? Good Christian values tell you that it begins at home. Why are you spending all this money building up Churchill's regime, helping the French over Indochina, helping Milan and South Africa, and you're not even going to help your own people? All you're doing is building up repressive regimes. That to me is unforgivable. And for some of the wars that I'm hearing about these days, that attitude in the United States government has not changed, and it needs to. Thank you. I think we're now about ready to take some audience questions. I'm trying to summarize here. We have five British um, figures and one American here. Um, not, not counting myself, the moderate. We have three <laughs> scientists if we include your dismal science amongst them. We have one queen, and by the way, you were terrific in Shakespeare in Love. Uh, <laughs> we have three advocates of the rights of women, although with slightly different approaches to it, and, civil, and two civil rights workers. So we have um, a rather amazing cast here. Uh, we now invite you to ask questions of any or all of them on any subject whatsoever. This is your time to quiz uh, some of the great people of the millennium. Who, who would like to begin this process? Please don't be shy. Mm. 
Oh, yes, go ahead, sir. <laughs> Tell us, sir, what causes inflation. My views on what causes inflation are not far different from most other economists. That is, the excess of demand over supply. Let me ask, a, Richard Nixon's name was mentioned, although not favorably, by Charlotta Spears Bass. Let me ask a kind of Nixonian question. Are you, sir, or are you not a socialist? The Labor Party is a class party, and their class is not my class. No, I am not a socialist. I never was a socialist, although in years since, my understanding is that Keynesian, Keynes and Keynesian economics uh, have been accused of being socialist, uh, but I never was. If you reflect on it for a minute, you realize that the policies of the period of the 1930s of Great Britain Sweden and the United States in particular, and my writings served to defend and protect and revive capitalism, not to uh, give in to the uh, uh, dictates of socialism or the excesses of either communism or national socialism, fascism, Nazism. No. But if socialism is government management of the economy, that's just what you advocated during times of crisis. Socialism can more properly be understood as the government ownership of the means of production and distribution. Uh, government getting involved in the economy is not socialism. After all, if you think historically, uh, government uh, in the in the persons of monarchs, in the policies of mercantilism, uh, in the explorations of Great Britain, the Netherlands, Spain in the 16th century meant that government was very much involved in uh, the economies of the times, uh, but those were, were, those regimes, those periods were never called socialistic, uh, no. Other questions? Yes, uh, there's one over here. Why is, is your reputation not what it might be, and what exactly is the, the core of the, of the fiery potency of your writings? I'm going to answer that question in reverse order, or those questions. My writing was really very well accepted during my own time. Um, well, some of it was accepted well. Um, the speed with which I wrote The Vindication of the Rights of Man, it was really in a heat of, of production that I responded within a month after Burke had written his comments uh, on the French Revolution. And there were, of course, many, many men who were very angered by the fact that a mere woman had taken up the pen and written in a masculine voice. And probably one of the things that offended most is that I took it upon myself to criticize Mr. Burke for his effeminate manner of writing, which was very emotional and very unreasoned, and asking people who were not very well read to respond emotionally to his assertions for which he had hardly any evidence. He was not a rational thinking man. However, when I wrote The Vindication of the Rights of Woman, there was a remarkably positive response, even among men, to the fact that I had brought to the fore the fact that women were human beings and who deserved the same rights which had been denied to them for centuries. Um, Dr. Price, who was my mentor, a, a, dissident, a dissident minister, fed to me spiritually and emotionally and intellectually many of the ideas 
And some that I, I hope that I had shared from him were the demagoguery of politicians and the fact that most politicians considered, men, uh, considered women beneath their contempt and their considerations. Um, I also oppose the idea of primogeniture, partly because of the nature of my own family. I was raised in a family of seven children, and I became really the source of, of uh, economic support for most of the members of my family. My older brother, who was born first in the line of primogeniture, was sent to law school, was treated as the darling of the family, whereas my sisters and I had to fend for ourselves. I, as a ladies' assistant, as a teacher, as a governess to small girls, and became independent only when I began my own writing and was, a mentor, was mentored in that. But the whole issue of primogeniture and the mistreatment of women by men, my own mother was uh, beaten and abused by my father, who was a drunk. Uh, the fact that I was left behind with a small baby by my beloved Imlay, all of these things fed into my anger, I, I believe, about the role of women. And that struck a responsive chord, even among rational thinking, men. I would then follow up with my answer to your first question as to why I do not have the reputation I might deserve. And I, I must say that comes from the kind efforts of my husband, William Godwin, who after I died, wrote a full, honest, open account of our lives, including the fact that I had tried to commit suicide twice, that I had born an illegitimate child, that we were married after our daughter was conceived. Um, my daughter, Mary Shelley, who is probably another one of my contributions to culture in that she wrote Frankenstein and was married to the poet Shelley. But that the, during the period when my husband wrote this account of our lives, uh, people were stunned and astonished and considered me as much as a prostitute for having lived the way that I did. And, and my reputation suffered as a result of that and it has taken centuries, as I understand, for it to be for my works and my reputation to be honored as they should. Let me ask you a delicate question. I don't mean any offense by this, but isn't it also true that your writing is difficult to follow, that they're, it's not particularly lucid? In fact, it's been described as crabbed and uh, Baroque. If my writing is crabbed and Baroque, so uh, is the writing of most of my contemporaries. I did not seek out a writing style different from my contemporaries. And the invective, which was the majority of my writing for which I'm most well known, I believe fell directly into the style of my contemporaries. Um, I would urge you, sir, if you find my political writings difficult, that you might take up my letters, which I wrote while I was uh, Imlay's agent in Scandinavia, and my novels, which I'm also fairly well known for. Which novel do you recommend to us? Oh, uh, I think Mary would be a good one for you to begin with, The Wronged well, Woman. Is it still in print, do you know? Yes, it is. <laughs> good. Other question? Yes, madam. <laughs> That's correct. Yes. Why did you die so young? I died very tragically, actually. Um, I was delighted to learn uh, that I'd become pregnant and that I was certain that a small baby boy would be born to us. And as I had had no difficulty with the delivery of my daughter, Fanny Imley, and was looking forward to another child. In fact, I had taken Fanny with me with a nurse when she was just less than a year old and traveled in Scandinavia and felt very quite comfortable about having another child and looking forward to it. And as I mentioned, my husband and I lived separately, so I was writing messages to him as he was working in his lodgings and said that I was certain that the creature would be born soon and he should come. And we uh, had a, a midwife who attended me, and the baby girl was born fine, but the placenta did not descend. And so I suffered for 10 days, and I died of puerperal fever. There was another question down here. Yes, sir. How did your views differ from standard Orthodox Christianity of your time, and were you persecuted for your uh, um, heterodox views? Um, initially, my views were no different from the uh, Church of England. But with the extensive studies that I did of the Bible and of the surrogate writings um, of the early Christian church, uh, I came to believe that the 
issue of the Trinity separated myself from uh, traditional uh, Anglican Church and um, would not take the vows at Trinity because I, I could not profess my belief in the Trinity. It was Trinity College. Um, and was able, through some friends of mine, to secure uh, essentially a dispensation from the King when I became Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Trinity College at Cambridge. And um, continued, continued those studies into my faith for basically the rest of my life. Um, my own beliefs were that um, uh, there had essentially been a hoax per perpetrated in the church uh, of those that um, said that Christ was um, co-equal with God the Father. And I do not believe that. Um, today you would basically, I guess, classify me as a, a believer in the beliefs of Arian, and I am an Arianist. Um, Arius as opposed to Arian. As opposed to Arian, yes. Right. Uh, A-R-I-A. It's an important distinction, but uh, let me just tell you this, that um, I said Thomas Jefferson admired you enormously, considered you the greatest man who ever lived with the possible exception of Jesus, whom he didn't think was the Christ. But here in, in this, our happy country, uh, he made it possible that uh, a person of your genius would not have to have dispensation from the crown to have his own beliefs. Don't you find it outrageous that a man of your intellectual capacities, your range, perhaps greater than any king who has ever lived, with apologies to Queen Elizabeth, isn't it outrageous that the crown should presume to tell you what you can or cannot profess as a human being with respect to the life of your conscience? Well, the issue of politics and religion is a difficult one that I would just as soon keep separate from my professional life as a scientist. And um, my personal beliefs, um, shared by some, are, are my personal beliefs. I, I still consider myself a Christian. I believe in, in God, the Almighty. Um, but that's a delicate issue in any society, and it was more, I think, than uh, the king was ready for. The king did not know he was giving me dispensation for my religious beliefs. He felt that uh, there, re there were other reasons, and I, uh, I do not believe it would have been politic to raise those at the time. That makes it even more outrageous. Let me ask Charlotte a Bass question. Um, you were a civil rights leader and a woman um, at a time when there was widespread prejudice against both of those categories, women and uh, African-American people. Did you ever feel personally threatened? Was your life ever in danger? Were you ever pelted, booed, any, any public uh, disorder that was caused by your, your life as a public figure? Um, well, that is a very good question. For the most part, the press liked to rip me apart. Time Magazine at one point described um, me as shockingly pink, not because I was a woman, but because they believed me to be a communist. And the reason for that is when I went and visited the Soviet Union in the late 40s and early 50s, I traveled through Soviet Georgia and compared it to American Georgia. And let me tell you, the difference was astounding. There were black children and white children playing together. Women were competing with men in all industries. The country had recovered from the rule of the czar to a point that there were 800 very large industries in Soviet Georgia. While our American Georgia had recovered, it had not done what they had accomplished. They had gotten rid of racism and gender bias. And then when I returned home and really espoused that fact, people definitely printed against me. Um, at that period of time, I had given up the California Eagle, which had been my paper for 40 years, and the new owner of the California Eagle actually printed against me. So I had actually other blacks attacking me. But uh, so far as being physically in danger, I was thrown in jail. I. Um, walked picket lines, I stormed city council chambers, I stormed the state legislatures, and so yes, I was one of those civil rights leaders who was arrested quite often. Well, let me just see if I got this straight. You were in Soviet Georgia, and yes, you I was. found its social conditions to be better than those of Americans Georgia, 
That is, is correct. the link of Soviet enlightenment vis-a-vis -vis our Georgia uh, coincidental with communism or causative? Do you, do you believe that the communist regime was better about these social relations than our capitalist uh, regime was? I feel on those two issues, yes, they were. They had actually achieved something that America, and believe me, I'm a very strong, stalwart American, they had achieved something that we had not. That would be controversial even, even today, I think. I'll take a few more questions. Yes. Fifteen thirty-four, I believe, is the date. Ian Bolin, my father, King Henry VIII. Um, yes. And, and that was your question? You were the yes. first child of Anne Boleyn? Yes, I was the first child of Anne Boleyn, and by the time I was 10, 11, I had seen um, both my mother and uh, King Henry's next wife killed in the Tower of London. I believe the order, he had six wives, I think the way, right. the way to remember this is divorced, yes. beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Right, right. Exactly, and, and the one that was widowed probably was the one that got off the best. Hmm. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Do you have any thoughts on Lady Jane Grey? I think that I had, uh, it, was, it was a difficult time in that uh, all of the people around me, I had to be, uh, I always felt that uh, each one of them in some way was were vying for my position, and so... There was a great deal of uh, caution in relation to all the women uh, and all the people around me in terms of my position. Um, yes? Steady state. Can you envision a, an economy that is a steady state, that is an economy without growth as one of its necessary dynamos? During my life, I wasn't inclined to uh, make public utterances off the top of my head without some opportunity to look into things in some detail and uh, uh, gather statistics. I am a mathematician. And uh, uh, although I never was fascinated with the world of econometrics, uh, I, am, I am part of the world of macroeconomics. Uh, therefore, I'm hesitant to say very much about what you've just described to me for the first time since I haven't been around since 1946. Uh, but my first inclination is to agree with that. Remember, in my life, I tried to take reality as it could be observed, because as it could be seen, as it could be determined, and, and understand it and derive economic principles from the real world. The real world, as you've described it and as I am inclined to believe, is one of uh, a new set of problems from those we discerned readily in uh, the 1930s and 1940s, a world of, of uh, rapidly increasing population, or as some would say, I understand it, overpopulation, and uh, finite uh, resources in certain senses. Uh, however, it's my, uh, my inclination to think that resources can be redefined given the state of technology that you enjoy and the world, as you have described it, of recycling. 
and uh, that uh, uh, we, we, you must, uh, I'm sorry, I'm no longer a participant, but you must uh, come up with new ways to deal with resources uh, so that resources recycled and redefined become new resources. Uh, I guess that may be what you're talking about, steady state economics without, uh, without the continuing uh, mining of depleting uh, uh, reserves of iron or oil or, or this kind of thing. I may have misunderstood you, but uh, did I answer your question? We'll leave it at that for the moment. Uh, let me, uh, I'd we, be glad we'll take, to get in conversation. <laughs> we're going to take a few more questions, but let me just quickly say, I've just been sitting here thinking, several of you gave your names to concepts. Uh, it's something when you, you actually give your name to the world. Keynesian, we've already talked about. Elizabethan, you gave your name to a whole age. Mm -hmm. um, Newtonian, of course. There's no Wollstonecraftian so far as I know, but yeah. um, <laughs> you gave your name to a unit of um, energy, the watt. Can you tell us what a watt is? Well, actually, the watt was named in honor of me, but had little to do with, with my work. I, I suppose, uh, actually, the watt should have been applied to the horsepower, because that's what I standardized was the, the measure of the horsepower and how much horsepower was available from uh, a fire engine. So I guess it uh, is a curious thing in, in a more modern society to name a unit of energy after, after me when uh, really it, it didn't pertain much to my work. But uh, I did help standardize units of measurement of energy so that, that uh, my inventions could be compared against previous steam engines and determine the efficiency of my engine. Uh, I, w I think I would like to uh, address a little bit of the question that was asked to uh, our economics uh, professor. The steady state question. Yes. Uh, from an inventor's perspective, uh, what we, we need is more basic research into the physical world around us. We need to use more of the, the mathematics that's available and find how to apply this mathematics to our physical world. My inventions came about because I understood the, the mathematics that could explain our natural world. Basic research had been done by men before me for a hundred years and I looked at it, explanations for the behavior of gases and for how heat was transferred. And I use that basic, that basic knowledge to then invent new applications, new developments in technology. So if we have limitations now in this time with the amount of material available, what may be necessary is a, a different look at how to use the materials and maybe a new look at, at what another energy supply might be. It was unheard of at my time to harness fire, but yet I helped do that and do so very efficiently. So maybe this steady state problem is, is actually a misconception. What we need is more basic research to look at a new way to use our resources. Let me just quickly ask one last follow-up question of you. Um, we have vehicles today uh, that, have, that are rated as 200 horsepower, 300 horsepower probably shocking to your sensibility, but how did you determine what one horsepower was? Well, um, it was known how much power was available from a horse working on a turnstile, uh, such as lifting water out of a, a, a mine you can, using an Archimedes screw. And using the amount of uh, power that was available from a horse over a time period, I then standardized with slight rounding numbers to ease my calculations that uh, 33,000 pounds could be raised in one foot in one minute. So 
that standardized what a horsepower was. My engines, I thought, were quite large at the time. We, we built some engines that were 20 horsepower engines. Doesn't this depend upon the horse? On the average. Ah, okay. It, this is the average horse. Okay, we're going to quickly dispatch these questions. Go ahead, madam. The question is about Robert Fulton, the American inventor's application of steam for steam boats. Do you have a thought? There were many people who wished to use my technology uh, for other purposes, and I thought that was appropriate as long as their uses did not infringe upon my patents. Uh, throughout my life, it was necessary for me to defend my inventions and the patents that I, I had obtained so that I could maintain my uh, financial stability. So I had no real concern with Fulton as long as his modifications to my steam engine were a uh, first and true invention of his own and not an infringement upon my ideas and my patents. Other last chance. Go ahead. Yes. interesting question. It's really a question about progress, and it's, it's a hard question for Chautauquans because, of course, you didn't live to see this world, and one of the rules of Chautauqua is that you stay in character and speak to your own time and place, but the suggestion is, will you speculate a little bit about the world that has developed since your time? Is it still a progressive world? Are we getting better? Let's start with you, Charlotte. In many ways, the opportunities for women and for minorities have improved. In a lot of ways, however, the problems of minorities are still there. They have been simply shoved under the rug from what I have observed from the afterlife. I think for myself, the genocide that has been going on, going back to guns or butter, do we clothe and house people rather than wage war? is still applying in this day and age. So in that particular aspect, I find that the world has not progressed. But in other ways, that yes, it has. Mr. Keynes. The twin scourges of communism and Nazism, fascism, have been defeated. We have demonstrated, and it has come to be accepted, that uh, the whole society needs to participate in the economy, including the government. To that extent, therefore, our economic world is better off than it was in the 1930s. Uh, in 1966, the noted, um, uh, well, in 1972, Richard Nixon, I'm uh, told, said, we're all Keynesians now. I have to think the world is therefore a little better off since we're all Keynesians now. Uh, there are many other problems that have now manifested themselves uh, much more and in, which in some ways seem more intractable than the problems we faced in the first part of the 20th century, uh, again, of overpopulation and this sort of thing. So I can't make a blanket statement that we are better off or the world is better off. Uh, it depends which part of the world, which part of academia you look at. Um, uh, Queen Elizabeth, you're, I don't mean this personally, but you are the oldest representative on, on the Thank stage you. tonight. Um, I've studied the Elizabethan age quite um, a bit. I'm not even certain that you believed in progress in your time. Do you think the world got better since your death in 163? I would say so. If you look at uh, the year 1562 or 3 in London, 20,000 people died of the plague. Uh, in, in 1673, I got my first water closet in Richmond, uh, which suggests something about progress. 
um, water closet is, you know, the bathroom. And uh, so, and, and the whole, uh, I think that over time you've improved uh, in your sensitivity towards a, towards a concern for humans. Uh, the kinds of punishments that I meted out to, to my people during my reign, I suppose are still being done today. Often there were times when I would increase the punishment. For instance, when people were to be hung, I would suggest that they be hung lightly so that after they drop, they are quite alive to be then disemboweled. You know, and so I, so the, the level of, of wickedness and uh, cruelty was huge in, in my day, and I suspect is still huge in today, uh, but perhaps there's a little more sensitivity. I doubt that we're going to have a chance to come back to you, so let me just ask the final question of you. Um, I doubt that any person in history has been more celebrated by more great literature than you were. Shakespeare, John right. Donne, Spencer. Edmund Spencer, mm -hmm. Sidney. Right. Um, you are the most celebrated figure in the history of the world, in the greatest mm -hmm. cluster of poets. What is the source of all that? We know you were great, but that's even mm -hmm. beyond our imagination. Perhaps that uh, there is greatness and there's a... You know, when one is powerful, one always uh, attracts people who want to... Uh, to want to uh, make them look quite well. And, and, and being the most powerful woman in Europe, I had many people I could not really tell whether I was being the celebrity because of myself or because of my power. A very natural kind of thing. Thank you. James Watt. Well, my work was part of what has become known, uh, at least I'm told, as the Industrial Revolution, which was the beginning of the age of individualism and materialism. I would say if, if a comparison is made of the quality of life that I had compared to the quality of life of present day people in this room, I would imagine that the comfort of living now is much better than my comfort. When um, my first wife died during her fifth pregnancy, uh, I didn't know about it. I was away you know, working in Scotland, and I didn't receive the, the letter until two days after she had died. So the ability to communicate, I imagine, is much better now than it was in my day. The desire for a steam carriage. You know, transportation in my day was very difficult. 10, 12 miles would be a very hard day's travel. And I've heard that many of the people probably in this audience traveled much farther than that to come here this evening. So the quality of the individual life, I imagine, is much better now. But along with, with these advancements, there's always, always some other complications. And I reckon, recognize some of them with my early work when my first steam engine, the experimental engine that I built, uh, at our foundry in Soho um, killed my partner's garden because of the smoke and the particulate that came out of it and the, the low grade of coal that we were burning, the acid fumes, scorched his garden. So I understood that with all development there was going to be some consequences. So the trade-off for the better standard of living is a different set of consequences, a different set of uh, standards that we have to, to put up with as far as our quality of life. We may be more material, but we may have lost some of the what was available in my time. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Wollstonecraft, progress. I believe that we have made incredible progress, if I am correct in assuming this from Mrs. Bass, uh, a person who is an, an American Negro. I presume that slavery no longer exists in this country. It was one of the abominations during my time. I am delighted to learn that she had advanced so far that she was running for the legislature and representing her people and women, uh, a dream that I had at the time when I was writing my works. It seems, however, that the demagoguery of politicians seems to still exist here, and a reference to a Mr. Nixon, is that correct? That has not died out. I don't know if he is still alive or not. Um, the issue of education seems to have gone beyond my dreams. It seems here at this particular institution that men and women are, are educated equally with no regard whatsoever to their sex, and that is delightful to me. That is marvelous to me. 
Um, I had the opportunity to listen to your speech uh, earlier today, Dr. Jenkinson, and it seems to me, though, that on the other hand, there are still, there's still work to be done. Um, you spoke of the need for distribution still in our world, and that was a major consideration of mine as well in my books. Um, the, as I said, the tyranny of the rich, I called it, and the fact that even the rule of primogeniture allowed for huge amounts of land to be inherited by people who neither worked for nor had the talent for achieving any of, of the wealth which might have been accumulated to them through inheritance. And that seems to still be going on in the world. Uh, the question of uh, how are we going to stop getting and spending and begin working on our soul. I said in, in my vindication of the rights of women that um, I knew that life is, is like a huge struggle that we continually roll a giant rock up a hill and it rolls back down and we must continue to work, but that nothing worth having can be bought. Nothing worth having can be bought. And so the issue of our souls, which it seems now are, are not adjusted to sex as they were, in, as, it, as it might have been in our time, that men had souls and women perhaps did not, that no longer seems to be an issue and that I would concur with you that working on our souls is primary work. Thank you. Mr. Newton, in some regards, your reputation has taken the biggest beating in the, in the 20th century, although uh, you're still considered the greatest mathematician and physicist that the West has known. There's a new physics called quantum physics, which in some regards fundamentally corrects some errors or at least some imprecisions in your mechanics. Uh, progress. Talk about scientific progress. Well, certainly from my point of view, um, progress has to do with how we understand God's creation. And although there are some corrections made, I, 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 in this last week that I've been around, I've found it fulfilling that the, the lifelong dream that I had of um, unifying our understanding of the universe. I took uh, the work of Copernicus and Galileo trying to understand how, how God's handiwork has come to pass. And that, in fact, my uh, professional um, offspring, um, Stephen Hawking, Luke, current Lucasian chair of uh, mathematics at Trinity, is really after the same thing that I was after 300 years ago. Um, certainly much has been accomplished, and it's, it's been good for me to see the, the strides that have been made in, I think you now call it chemistry, um, we did things differently 300 years ago, but particle physics and astrophysics and the understanding of the, f to think that we might, as a human race, begin to understand what happened in the first second of creation, this was a dream of mine. So I would have to say that I am wholly heartened by what uh, the intellect of humans has, uh, has done over the last 300 years. I would, it would just be so much fun to go on and on. Every one of you is fascinating. I know we can't linger forever. It's Friday night. People have things they must go do. But let me ask you one last question. I'll probably never get this chance again. You explained how gravitation works. Can you tell us what gravitation is? Probably less so now than 300 years ago. Um, I think you are still debating as, as to whether it is a particle or a wave, which is the same debate that we had 300 years ago about light. Um, we certainly know that much of matter can be conceived of as being particles, but is light a wave or is it a particle? We may not, as humans, be any closer to that now than I was in its understanding 300 years ago, and pretty much the same with gravity. Why should one body draw another? If I could answer that question now, I would ensure my name to be remembered a thousand years from now. Very well. well. Let's give them a round of applause. What, a, what an amazing thing Chautauqua is. Don't you love it? People imagining themselves to be great figures of history and coming and bringing those points of view to life so beautifully. I think this is just extraordinary. Let's go down the line quickly and introduce yourselves as modern scholars and just say a word of commentary about the character that you have performed. Let's start with you, Bob. Uh, my name is Bob Bohack. I teach uh, mathematics here at North Idaho College. Uh, my introduction to Sir Isaac Newton was uh, certainly originally 
as I was a math major and a physics minor in college, I knew of his scientific works. Uh, what has astonished me in learning about Isaac as a human being is his, um, uh, he was an iconoclast, to put it mildly. Um, he had a huge ego, um, got back at everybody who harmed him in his early life when he became uh, master of the mint and then eventually president of the Royal Society. And as long as you were his friend, you were in good shape. If you weren't, uh, it was oblivion as far as science was concerned. He believed wholeheartedly in what he was attempting to do um, to an extreme. Uh, mental breakdown, uh, very close to a mental breakdown at one time, um, very isolationist in his, uh, in, in his work um, and would not, would not stand for anyone attacking his work uh, on personal grounds. If they could show that he was wrong on uh, experimental grounds, he was more than willing to listen to them. But um, that became very detrimental uh, because it took um, several decades to get his publications out and into the world, which led to a, a very, very strong clash between British scientists and European continental scientists that probably lasted for the next hundred years and affected the development of uh, science and mathematics in particular. This, this question requires a one-word answer only. If we popped Newton down today and he sat next to Einstein or Oppenheimer or Niels Bohr, would Newton be able to understand quantum mechanics? I believe he would, yes. Uh, Virginia. I'm Virginia Johnson. I'm head of English, Foreign Languages, Humanities, and Fine Arts here at the college, and I've been here for 33 years, in case you're wondering. I am, I believe, the most long-lived, I may be the oldest person up here on the stage. Um, and I came to know Mary Wollstonecraft through my English literature class. Uh, after several years of teaching from that text, women were finally included, and there she was. And I had to concur with Clay. The first time I read her, I went, oh my god. My students will never be able to decipher this. Having read her now five or six times through, I'm beginning to say, oh, she's crystal clear. Um, my students each semester go, oh my gosh, what is this? But I lead them through. I usually go in costume to class. That's how I began this, was just an alert to say, what would happen if I dressed up? And it's really grown from there. I think Mary Wollstonecraft was a genius. I wish I were a genius. I think her emotional and personal life was a mess. She probably needed Prozac or something. Um, but she was a genius. She really was a woman before her time. And I guess part of my agreeing to be Mary Wollstonecraft is somewhat of a missionary approach to making Wollstonecraftians, if I can. I don't think she's had the recognition that she deserves. She was the intellectual equal of Thomas Paine, I believe, maybe even of Thomas Jefferson. Um, I say that with great trepidation. <laughs> no one who's here. But she held her own against some of the most intellectual men in her time and never spoke down to them, nor they to her. She was a part of an intellectual circle in London that, where she was the only woman who belonged. And so courageous, I can't believe it. She went to France during the revolution, knowing the revolution was going on, with no companions. She traveled in Scandinavia in the 1890s with a tiny baby and a nursemaid. She didn't speak any of the languages there. She had taught herself uh, to speak French, which became the language that she could communicate in, to, to, to do business for this rat of a boyfriend of hers who was probably running guns for the French Revolution. <laughs> so We'll want to hear the full just, monologue yes. after that. <laughs> Dale. Uh, I'm Dale Marcy. I teach chemistry and environmental science at North Idaho College. Uh, I found learning about James Watt uh, very intriguing. He started out as what I think we'd call nowadays a nerd. He uh, was a, a real um, work addict. He was an inventor. He was very creative. But um, he actually got better with time. Uh, some of his early inventions were of, of minor importance. But as it was actually in the middle of his life, uh, as he was freed from some of the drudgery of, of workaday world, having to earn a living, and he was actually hired by his, his financier as just an inventor. He actually uh, developed many uh, applications of the, the steam engine. And as he matured, he, like many humans, uh, he moved from uh, his small world into a, a look at the, at the bigger world. And he got to, to move through Europe 
uh, get to know some of the Americans, Benjamin Franklin, uh, Lavoisier, a uh, Frenchman. He learned chemistry, and he, was, uh, he enlarged himself tremendously and was uh, much more of a person than he was as a young man. So I found it very in intriguing that uh, the, the stages of his development is much like what we might consider the stages of many men's development. Thank you. Um, Don, you were stunning Elizabeth. Tell us about this. I'm Dawn Atwater, and I'm the alumni person on campus here at NIC. Um, one of the difficulties in playing Elizabeth for me was the fact that she, she ruled England for 45 years. And so from the time she was 25 until she was, uh, you know, close to 70. And when you look at anyone who's, who's held a position like that for some 45 years, the nature of them changes over time as it would for you and I. So trying to isolate a period when I want, where I felt comfortable being her was a challenge. Um, the other thing is that the literature about her, for instance, she rarely spoke of her mother occasionally. She, she did talk about her father and said that uh, she might not uh, have raised lionesses, but she was, um, she had been raised by a lion. She had some great respect for her father, but hardly ever mentioned her mother. And in trying to dig into that family um, dyad between her mother and father and all of those wives and trying to find out what she must have felt and where she was and all that, it was difficult. Uh, it left me sort of saying, well, of course she wouldn't get married. She would realized how unsafe that was just in looking at her parents. And so I tried to dig under and... Uh, and it was a monumental task because uh, uh, there's really not much written about her soul, as uh, Mary Wollstonecraft would say. There's more written about her action. And uh, I wish I knew more about how she really thought. We're having a little Elizabeth Renaissance here, aren't we? Yeah, Films yes, sure in every direction, are. new yes. biographies. But she was, a, she was feisty, and, uh, and she played the lute. She played the virginals. She danced. Uh, she was a clever woman. She was very articulate. She could knock your socks off in the things she could say. Uh, she was really something. And, and for that, I, you know, on the other hand, you know, anyone that could be as, as, as barbaric as some of the things she proposed, uh, there's the other side. The dichotomy of human nature is always there. Uh, Keith, introduce yourself, please. I'm Keith Johnson. I'm originally from Spokane in North Idaho and then went away for several years where I was a a uh, Foreign Service Intelligence Officer, and when I retired from that, I've come home. I uh, started at one point to do, uh, toward a PhD in economics, and uh, many, many years ago became fascinated with John Maynard Keynes, and have uh, maintained fascination ever since. And I do uh, honestly believe that uh, his insights and his direction, his, his opening of doors and his, his um, linking of other disciplines to economics was uh, what probably made him the uh, great economist of the 20th century. A debate still goes on whether uh, where he was revolutionary, where he was uh, um, uh, reflecting other people. Uh, there was a, an economist in Sweden named Vixell, for example, who um, uh, had economic ideas that were really Keynesian put forth before Keynes did. But somehow uh, Vixell never became known, Keynes did. And uh, his greatness lies in part in his having harnessed economics to public policy and to um, uh, demonstrate that economists need to look at public policy and become involved in it and government leaders need to be really knowledgeable about theoretical economics or, or applied economics. Uh, he was an interesting person uh, in, as, as a person. He was a very active member of the Bloomsbury Group and maintained uh, an association with others in that group, particularly Virginia Woolf, uh, for the rest of his and their uh, lives. Uh, he was a homosexual during that part of his life. Uh, but in 1925 married Lydia Lubukova 
a Russian ballerina with the Diaghilev Ballet and uh, had an extraordinarily happy marriage with her for the rest of his life, 21 years until, 19, until he died in 1946, before either of his parents died, by the way. Uh, he uh, uh, did, uh, in his own life, reflect the need to be all-encompassing, obviously in personal things, in artistic things. He was a great collector of art. Uh, he also, uh, the question about um, uh, socialism was interesting, not only because it was planted with clay, but uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, fact is that uh, he was an investor of real talent and uh, was responsible uh, in that, in, in his official capacity with um, Cambridge University for increasing their uh, wealth uh, a, a great deal. He also increased his own, not through any guile or, or uh, uh, corruption, but simply through very prudent uh, and clever investments uh, and, and died a millionaire. Uh, it was a, uh, a, a real pleasure uh, doing the research on John Maynard Keynes, and it has been a real pleasure being part of, part of the Popcorn Forum, for which I thank Tony Stewart. Thank you. Amelia, let me um, close with you. I, I want to commend you, first of all, for doing a great portrayal, but this is a character we don't know about. Uh, you're, one of the things that Chautauqua attempts to do is do reclamation work for characters that should be known but aren't known. First of all, how'd you come upon this character, and why isn't she better known than she is? Um, I learned about Charlotta Spears Bass probably about five or six years ago when I was visiting an elderly uh, white woman that I know over Newman Lake, and she called me into her bedroom, and she wanted to show me an article about a woman who had run for vice president back in 1952. And when I sat down on her bed to read the article, I saw a picture of a black woman, and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I have never heard of her. And so then when I was asked to take, play, take part in this popcorn forum, I chose her as my character. And I started looking for information. And it was very difficult. Um, she's found in the Encyclopedia on African American Women. And then her book, um, they actually had to send away to the San Francisco Library to find a copy of it. And I have not really been able to find anything else about her. Um, it's been just digging through what I read in her memoirs. Um, I had to find out about the California Eagle, who had initially founded it, and just put pieces together. I have to say that she was easier to do than the character I did last year, Pertione, uh, where there were just fragments, true fragments. There was at least a solid book about her and a little bit more history known. Um, I really enjoyed it um, just because uh, she is the same generation as my grandparents. And my grandfather, I know, even though he was a preacher, he was extremely militant and very much uh, working towards non-discriminatory hiring practices and things like that. And it really gave me an insight into what happened in the early part of the century, uh, things that we really don't hear about in the history books. I had never heard about the race riots in Houston in 1917. I didn't realize when they are laughing about zoot suits, those men were going out and killing young black and Mexican uh, men, basically boys, in Los Angeles. And Charlotta was one of the people who would go there and try and rescue those young men who were cowering st in street corners being chased by the police. And it just really amazed me everything that she did. If she saw something wrong, she would form another association, she would form another political party, she would go out there and do something about it. And I think that that's something that we as Americans really need to remember. I really think that we've become extremely passive. We're used to the prosperity that we've had the last 20 or 30 years, despite the fact that we've had recessions. I think we've forgotten what it means to really fight and really stand up for what we believe in. So I've enjoyed it, and I always love the Popcorn Forum. Thanks. Uh, let's give the last word to the man without whom this wouldn't have occurred, Tony Stewart. Tony? Oh, well. Uh, first of all, that is Amelia Phillips, who is on the faculty at Spokane Falls Community College and a former colleague of mine here at North Idaho College, and she comes back because she 
loves the ideas and she loves the popcorn form. For the 29th year, it's my pleasure to announce that it has been a success. And I, like the legislature, can sign I die the process. But before I do, I, I just want to take this moment to educate you to the process. Amelia Phillips asked if I would come to Spokane Falls to start a similar series. I've been asked to come to Ada County to look at the same kind of process for that city and county. For 29 years, wonderful people have been willing to contribute their time and energy, both as visitors to this campus and also those who are here, so that we can have a free market of ideas. When I arrived 29 years ago, <clears throat> and I was just a pup, and believe it or not, I'm not even near retirement, uh, I wanted to do something for the college that would come into some kind of realization. And I named this series The Popcorn Form the first year. I want it to be unique. I want it to be something that when it was advertised that <clears throat> it would be its, have its own identity. And some of our national speakers say to me, what on earth is a popcorn form? And I say, you have answered the question. It is a curiosity. Ideas are curious. As we close this series for this year, I want to say to you that for many years, each year the topic was very different. One year we did a week on the dangers of nuclear war. Another year we did uh, the problems of racism. One year we did Orwell's 1984. Four years ago, we chose to have a series that would last more than one year. And for four years, we've had something called Journey Through Time. I would like Judy Whatley to please stand. She's over here. I want to teach for just a moment about the seeds of how something happens. Judy is a very good friend of mine, and uh, she and I go out to dinner so often, and that's a very, very dangerous process because we always come away with more work to do. And she leaned across the table during dinner as a friend of the popcorn form, and she said, Tony, I want you someday to do a, a, a week or one year on people in history. My immediate response was, I'll think about it. She's very aggressive. She leaned forward and said, you won't think about it. It's just a matter of when you will do it. And from that wonderful conversation was born the idea of journey through time. What I need to say in closing this particular 29th year is that it cannot succeed by any one person or even a suggestion of an idea, but it takes and it's essential to have a team. First of all, I want to thank and get on record again the Idaho Humanities Council for giving us a grant for the fourth year. And without that grant, we could not have done these things to the extent we have. By the way, the Idaho Humanities Council has a great, great admiration from our good friend, Dr. Clay Jenkinson. In addition to that, for 29 years, the Associated Student Government of North Idaho College has funded this. We started with our first appropriation of $40, and it was all to purchase popcorn. And it's grown into this. And three, we also receive funds from the college in the convocations budget. But in addition to that, I want to also recognize my great friend and Virginia secretary, and I borrow her for the popcorn form. And Virginia is an incredible supporter of the series, and she has no hesitation to allowing this woman for 12 months a year to work with every detail with me. And I wish she would rise now, Dorinda Moyer. Let's say thank you. There is a committee made up of the convocations and the popcorn form. They will meet next week, and they meet week after week, getting ready for next year, as they have in the past. Uh, Justin Van Eat and his staff here, the transportation department, the faculty, the staff, the community leaders here, people like my friend Keith, who comes from Spokane to participate, are all part of this, the students. And without the colleagues I have at North Idaho College that really believe in this and teach it in the classroom, it also could not succeed. But I do have to recognize very much the scholars who come here from throughout the United States. In addition to scholars, other people who are not scholars but experts in certain areas that speak throughout the year. We do have other programs other than this one. With my friend Clay Jenkinson teaching us on what the Chautauqua movement is, and he's been here for the last two Januaries to teach. And today I received several telephone calls saying, Tony, the members on the panel, they're getting better and better and better. And it's through this teaching and then the then those of you who attend, like Virginia and others, teach others. And therefore, we really are into the framework of how this works. I also find from the students and the faculty and others that it's the easiest format for learning. And I think that is why it is so popular. 
I can announce tonight, it appears when I have the final figures added up, that we will have had in attendance this five days 4,000 people. That is very, very promising and encouraging to me. Let me say, too, in relation to the scholars that are so willing to come, there's over 40 people, and some of them are here tonight, faculty, staff, community people, and five students this year, have spent months. They have two things going for them. Number one, most of all these people are experts in the field. It didn't happen in the last four months. It's happened over many, many, 20, 25 years in school and preparing themselves, and like Keith with the year, 25 years experience in government. But then they're willing to take a character, and for the last four months or five months, they've given intense study to that. One member of this group two years ago, in preparing her role over 12 months, she read 30 books. And so what I conclude with is to say, these people, because of their commitment and dedication to education and ideas, are providing you a wonderful gift. And I say that's why we succeed. And so I want to say in closing, we are just thrilled from our human spirit that this is what life is all about. And we're better human beings and better human relationships because we take time to celebrate. And when that auditorium was filled yesterday, I said to some of my friends, we do this in athletics and other activities, but at North Idaho College, in addition to that, which is fine, we also gather in huge numbers to exchange ideas, and we want you back next year, and you're very special to us, and because of you, we can continue. Tony, Thank you. One, one last word. What is the theme for next year? Let's advertise the dates and the theme and get it <laughs> over with here. You should put on your calendar, it's the third week of March, right, Dorinda? Monday through Friday, we have magic five days. Excuse me, madam. And so the theme next year will be, not the exact title, but it will be about the 20th century. Clay and I are about to adjourn and to go have a session and plan next year. He can't get out of town without a planning. And one final thing is that she planned, a lady came to me today that was here from Spokane, and she said, I must go back Monday and tell my boss, I have to tell him a year ahead of time when my vacation is, so please tell me the week so I'll have my vacation next year. That's what it's all about. Good night, everyone. Thank you.